Did you know that there are over 65 million Gen Xers, yet so few financial advisors focus on Gen X? Why? It's because you aren't rich. Yet. Welcome to the Gen X Money Advisor with Michael Labus, certified financial planner, certified college funding specialist, and founder of Gen X Wealth Partners. This podcast focuses on the specific needs of Gen Xers by a Gen Xer. Get ready to explore topics that will help you get your retirement on track, maximize your dollar towards your child's education, and successfully manage aging parents. We will even sprinkle in a little health and wellness, travel and leisure, and time and stress management. Come and experience the expertise of Michael and his special guests who focus on enhancing the quality of your life today and in the future. Now, on to the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Gen X Money Advisor. And today, I'm very excited to have Chris Humer from Northern Trust. He is the senior investment strategist over there. And our topic today, which is one that I'm really excited about, is we're going to talk about environmental, social, and governance investing and what that exactly is because I don't really think that people understand it because there's so many ways to describe it. And I'd like to introduce Chris. Hi, Michael. Thanks for having me on the podcast. Thank you for coming on. So like I just said, Chris, we're going to talk about ESG investing today. And I don't think people really understand it. There's so many ways to talk about this. There's socially responsible, there's sustainable investing, and then there's ESG. Are those synonymous? What do that? What do they mean? So let's see if we can help people really understand what it is, so they can have more confidence in maybe dipping their toes into this investment arena. Yeah, absolutely. And and, and Michael, I think all of those terms are within the same lexicon and mean similar things. There's slight nuanced differences uh, amongst them. But I think for the end user, the end investor, you're all trying to get along the same themes, which is trying to find ways to evaluate companies, not just from a financial standpoint, but along the lines of uh, a stewardship standpoint as well. So let's start with environmental. I mean, I think that's pretty straightforward, but I like to educate everybody as to what that really means. Yeah, absolutely. I think of the the three that we're going to talk about, you know, when we talk about ESG, let's start right at the beginning of what those three letters mean. And it's environmental, social, and governance. And obviously the E is environmental. I think from most of the investors that I talk to, that is the easiest of the three to wrap their heads around. I think there's been a lot of press around it. Most people ha- are aware tangentially or, or more so about the Paris Accords, about companies looking to have net zero carbon emissions by a specific date, whether it's 2050 or sooner or later, uh, that you're seeing uh, countries sign up for this as well. Uh, that environmental, I think, is the easiest one of these to, to wrap your head around, and that we're talking about uh, impacts on the environment. And you know, a lot of it's focused on one specific area, which is carbon emissions, uh, degradation of air quality, smog, all the all those elements of it. But I would I would say that there it expands much further than that. If we think about timberland production, uh, if we think about biodiversity, so. Um, Kind of to throw out uh, a tidbit there to create the standard Big Mac sandwich, it takes 30 gallons of water to produce it. Meaning, whether it's the packaging, whether it's raising the, uh, whether it's the lettuce and tomato on it, uh, raising the the cow for for the beef patties, all of that in uh, t- costs 30 gallons for that one single hamburger. So uh, it's beyond envir- uh, it's beyond carbon, but a lot of times carbon is where people start, which is looking at the carbon emissions from a firm and understanding what's the impact of that. Uh, okay. T- time out for a second here. 30 gallons of water equals one Big Mac. That, that 
blows my mind. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and from now on, I'm going to look at a Big Mac totally different. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it, it's the water consumption uh, for beef or from uh, from chickens as well. Uh, I don't have the number off the top of my head for uh, a pound of uh, chicken breast, how much uh, water consumption that takes and requires as well. But uh, you're looking at uh, a significant amount of resources for even something as simple as, as that pound of chicken you buy at the grocery store. Wow. Wow. I, I, I never thought of looking at my food that way. Now, now I will forever look at it that way. <laughs> so let's talk about social. Environmental, like you said, is the easiest one to understand what it is. But what is social and how does that fall into the ESG um, acronym? Yeah. So social covers uh, a gambit of different concepts. And there are things such as product safety. Things like worker worker safety uh, as well, um, as well as uh, elements such as diversity uh, of boards. I think that's one of the things when we look at regression analysis of various uh, data points. One of those that that tends to be one of the more material ones in the ESG landscape is that the diversity of a bo- of the board of directors of a company has material impact on the company. That, that's research has shown that, that having a diversified board actually benefits the company. So things along those lines, uh, you know, there's been some, there's products out there that look at thematic uh, elements like women-led companies. Has been a, there's a very successful ETF uh, from a competitor firm that looks at uh, that thematic uh, element of social. And I think as we sit here today, and and this goes for everything we've seen from an ESG landscape, but increasingly each of these elements has become more and more in demand by investors that they're looking at their portfolios through these different lenses, as opposed to just the, the financial lens. So I appreciate that definition there of the social, a little more in the abstract, but now that you said that, I think it's easy to understand that these are impacts. Uh, these are things that have impacts on the company through women, that companies, the diversity of board, and they've shown to actually strengthen the performance of the company. So we can see now how the social aspect plays into the actual running of the company, which leads us to the governance, which I think is, from my perspective, the foundation of ESG. I believe that without governance, the environmental and social aspects of the company would not exist. Do you agree with that, Chris? And maybe you can describe to everybody what the governance actually is, because it's probably also the most difficult to understand. Absolutely. And and Michael, I think you're correct that having uh, strong governance means that uh, the impact that shareholders have on the environmental and social aspects of the company are, are, are that much more impactful. So when we talk about governance, it's really about how transparent management is in their in in the management of the company, as well as how how interactive the board is. And there's several ways that you can measure this. You can measure elements that would keep board members locked into their seats. You can look at how uh, voting privileges are are dispersed. I think that's one of the things when we look at some uh, technology companies today is the the voting privileges are in the hands of a few original investors and it's hard to influence change as someone buying the actual common stock as well as different elements as far as reporting goes, transparency and process, transparency around risk about data elements there are all things that are measurable. And what we find is that the companies that have stronger governance around them and and have greater, less uh, covenants around keeping board members and managers in place, as well as giving all shareholders a voice, tends to be those companies that are able to enact the most change in the other areas of ESG as well. Uh, That's one of the things that we notice is that strong governance uh, policies 
a lot of times leads to better E and S results as well. So when you, when you look at the ESG investment theme, which of the letters do you think has the most impact on the overall performance? That's a good question because all of these elements do have uh, an impact over the long term. I think if you're looking at the most immediate term, in the short term, governance tends to have that ability to have the greatest influence today. But when you look at environmental and social, uh, those are are long term elements that affect the company. I think uh, the way that I've I've looked at this is is essentially when you're looking at E, S, and G data elements is a lot of times, as our, our directable, a director of sustainable investing once once said, and, and I think it's a great way of looking at it, is they're pre-finance terms, meaning that from a financial metric standpoint, they're not coming in the, in the financial metrics today, but they're things that will influence the company over time. So when you're talking about, say, from an environmental standpoint, as we see more countries and more states here in the U.S. move to uh, pressuring car companies to move to electric, to electric vehicles and move away from the internal combustion engine, you're seeing that that is going to have an influence on profit margin. It's going to have an influence on uh, capital expenditures. And so you're seeing that those companies that are further along in that transition are better positioned going forward. Uh, and you see that in, in things uh, when we look at energy companies, we see that there's energy companies that from a carbon transition are preparing themselves better going forward than some other companies that are sticking with their core business model as far as fossil fuel. So uh, for example, British Pet- Petroleum just bought, I believe it's Charge Master, uh, a series of electric vehicle infra- charging infrastructure uh, companies. Shell, World of Shell owns Green Lots, uh, which is another charging system out there today. Uh, so you're seeing some companies try and find ways to diversify their energy exposure away from fossil fuels. And then you have some other uh, energy companies that are sticking with what they believe in from uh, from a fossil fuel standpoint and uh, engaging in more exploration and, and production from that end. And I think that's one of these key elements is that over the long term, these are elements that we believe will have a material impact on the company. It's just when does that become relevant is a very lumpy process. You know, so for example, when you talk about some of the elements that we look at from a social well-being, things like product safety, inf- data information control, things like that, which uh, don't necessarily fit in that environmental bucket, but they fit in that social bucket. But some of those areas are are places where over the long term will have a direct impact on that company's business model that might not come out in the balance sheet and income statement today, but are absolutely crucial to be monitored and measured in in concert with everything else in a portfolio. So to that point, if we're talking about specific companies and with the data evolving over time and, and the impact evolving over time, how does an investor look at a company? How, are there are companies more ESG than others? Are some still ESG, but are some more? Can you explain how, how people should view companies? Because I see that a lot. Uh, there's some companies that you would never think would be ESG. And there's companies that you would think that's definitely an ESG and it's not. So could you explain how, how that plays out? Yeah. You know, I, I think there's a lot of elements to consider, you know, and I, th- I think that is the the evolution that we're seeing in the landscape of ESG today is commonality, uh, coming up with frameworks around this. One of the ones that we leverage in-house is there's a nonprofit called the Sustainable Accounting Standards Board that has what they call a materiality map. And really what it is, is in each of these buckets of, of ESG, and they actually have five different buckets where they get a little bit more granular. And within each of those buckets, they look at each specific industry 
and decide and, and come up with what matters most, most in those. So when you're talking about a utility company or an energy company, you know, those car those carbon emission elements are crucial primary drivers of how to evaluate those companies from an ESG standpoint. When you're talking about a financial services company that really doesn't have a large carbon footprint, there's other data elements that are more important to the materiality of that business. So things along the lines of data security, product labeling, those are the things that matter from a financial services company standpoint. When you're talking about an agricultural company, uh, you're talking about you know, uh, uh, you know, sourcing of goods, sourcing of uh, labor practices, all of those matter. So really these frameworks and the evolution of these frameworks uh, that is being used by sustainable investing or ESG providers today is really what what I think are where we're heading from having a good understanding of how to invest with these principles in mind. That is very interesting. So energy companies can qualify as ESG. I don't think that most people would, would have thought that because I think the common uh, mindset is energy companies are dirty. And they are anti-environment and they cannot be included in a portfolio. Kind of like when you have a socially conscious portfolio where they don't have alcohol or tobacco or any of the vices in the portfolio. I think that's a huge myth that's out there. And speaking of myths, I want to talk about uh, a couple of other ones that um, I think need debunked. Uh, One would be is you have to give up returns to invest uh, in ESG. Can you talk about that one, Chris? Yeah, and Michael, I think the two elements that you just talked about there oftentimes are related because I think the earliest ESG strategies were what I would call exclusionary strategies where they would remove large swaths of your investment portfolio like energy companies and say, okay, well, all energy companies are bad. So we are going to remove them from the portfolio. Now, what we've learned, and, and as someone who you know, has been an investor professionally for over 20 years, I, I look at most things through, through my investor hat, meaning that when I say, okay, I'm going to exclude, what that means to me is I'm taking a lot of idiosyncratic risk, you know, risk that I'm not compensated for taking. So when I remove energy companies or remove large swaths of the portfolio, uh, what I'm doing is I'm taking on risk. And as we've seen, uh, those have not been profitable uh, or have have led to underperformance uh, historically in these areas. And so I think that's one of the things that get tied is those early exclusionary models uh, were, were the ones that were linked to kind of that underperformance. What we've seen, and this has gone on for quite some time, is that As the ESG space has evolved from exclusionary to focusing on uh, elements of, say, uh, the term term that you'll hear in the ESG space is best in class, meaning, hey, as opposed to excluding energy, can we look at the energy sector and say, okay, these are the energy companies we should be investing in in the whole landscape? Uh, Those kind of elements looking across the board at finding best in class stocks in every sector is, in my opinion, a better way of building an ESG strategy from from someone who who works on the design of, of ESG product. That's what we would. That, that's what we like to do across the board. Is really look at it either from a best in class standpoint, or in integrating ESG elements within other aspects of investing. Those are really the the, the evolution of these buckets that we want to see. And so I think, and when you look at those models, you see much more compelling performance. What I would say is that you know, from from a modeling perspective, I don't view ESG as an alpha generator or a a risk anomaly uh, would be the term that we would use for things like uh, value or size or quality or low volatility, those factors that we use in many of our portfolios. For us, with ESG, you know, our, our, our thought is that we could deliver market returns with less risk over the long run is kind of the, the goal that we're looking to achieve uh, in, in the processes that we build. Uh, because we don't see that ESG is a long-term 
alpha generator from the, the limited research that we have. So we don't have confidence to say that today, but what we can do is deliver market returns, meaning you're not going to impair your portfolio by investing in ESG. And you could get a portfolio that has a significant reduction in fossil fuels and in carbon emissions while still having exposure to energy and utility companies and other aspects across the board. You know? So I think that's what makes compelling the, the newest wave of ESG products really compelling today. So I, I like to continue that thought. And when I talk to my clients about uh, ESG investing, socially responsible investing, sustainable investing, they want to invest in this. I don't see, really see a whole lot of gray area, which is what I'm trying to, to um, bridge. I see a lot of people who are really all about it or they don't understand it, so they don't want to touch it. So in terms of, is it risky? My thought is this, just the way that society is, is evolving, the whole ESG space is evolving. I think that this is a, a, an opportunity to invest in a new way of, of uh, judging a, co a company, reviewing a company. And think of it this way. If you've got two companies, uh, they produce the same good, and you knew one had strong ESG ratings and one didn't, I think that over time, the company that had strong ESG ratings would gain market share due to transparency. And that over time, I think the portfolios will be less risky and it's almost a form of arbitrage uh, in the marketplace. So I think that's why, as an advisor, I, I've been really big on this space for the past few years, trying to get ahead of this as best I can, because I see the long-term opportunities here. And that's why I brought you on here today, Chris, to educate not only my clients, but the general public about the opportunities that exist here. So I don't think it's any less, I don't think it's any riskier than the, than the, overall market, like you said there, but I think long-term there's opportunities here. So I like to you know, talk about what that future exactly is. Where do you see ESG you know, five years down the road and what are the opportunities that, that we have today? Yeah. And, and Michael, I think what you hit on is, is one of, I, I deal a lot more with advisors and institutions uh, than individual investors. And one of the things that I work with advisors on understanding is a lot of their clients are interested in sustainable investing and ESG. And a lot of times it's the advisor who kind of has their head in the sand and <laughs> is not looking at this element, even though their clients are, I'll throw you, throw you out a fact. Uh, we do a lot of survey work for both advisors and for clients. And, and one of the the stats in one of our most recent survey that we asked was, you know, how are investors, uh, high net worth in individuals in investing their, their assets around sustainable investing? And what we found is 30% of, of, of the survey participants are investing in ESG away from their advisor. That's, cra that's crazy. That they have... Yeah, accounts away from their advisor, and that is where their ESG investment is happening. And so, my 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 conversation with advisors a lot of times is like, "Hey, your clients are asking for this. You might not be hearing it, but this is something that they're materially asking about. And if you are not meeting their need, there they will find someone who is." So, Michael, kudos for you to to be out in front of this. Uh, and I think what it comes down to is most advisors are 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 trying to educate themselves on it. it it is a space that's evolving that has been that has been growing but as we've seen so much over the last 2 years with the pandemic most of the trends that we've seen that we we've, we've predicted that over the next 5 or 10 years are going to take place everything over the pandemic has accelerated so much has accelerated to what we thought would be a five to 10 year trend is a two year trend or a three year trend that we're already heading to places where, uh, and this goes across the board beyond just ESG investing, but we're seeing trends accelerate across the board. And, and ESG investing is definitely one of those where we're seeing those elements. So, so I guess I'll give you a great example of that. I, I think 
five or 10 years ago, what we what we talked about from an exclusionary investing standpoint was was true that investors said, you know, looked at ESG as an exclusive exclusionary investment and they said, uh, okay, well, if I have to give up returns for this, I'm not necessarily interested in that. I want to be able to find a way to invest in ESG why a while still being able to maintain market returns or or outperform the market or 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 they weren't willing to give up returns i would say that there is a significant in, a part of the investor base today that is willing to give up some of their returns for a carbon free portfolio so you know the way the average age of an advisor is well into their 50s and they're for the most part stuck in their ways and sometimes they are hesitant to look into new trends because it's not applicable to them, or at least they don't think it's applicable to them. I know the fact that my demographic that I work with, Gen X, about half of Gen X wants exposure to this. So that not only is it important to them, but it's important to me, which is why I have a platform that's dedicated to ESG investing and why I've taken the onus of understanding it, researching it, and getting ahead of it. You know, to your point, Gen X and people who want exposure to this, they want to have that emotional attachment to their investment. They want their money to speak for them uh, beyond making them money. They want to invest in companies that they believe in. And I, I've talked to some clients and I've talked to people about this. And I asked them, hey, if, if, if you want exposure to, let's say, electrical, electric vehicles and uh, I'm just going to say Tesla, not saying this is going to happen, but let's say Tesla lost 30%. Would you sell Tesla? And the response that I got was, nope, I, I would just, I might buy more. I would hold it because they believe in it. And that is such a different uh, experience for a client than just investing in a regular portfolio, we'll call it. There's no emotional attachment to it. So when their portfolio is down, they're, they're going to get emotional about it and they're going to sell, not looking at it from a more a pragmatic perspective where they understand the companies and they say, all right, that's fine. I believe in this. No, we're going to, we're going to hold. So I think it, it's a more meaningful experience for my clients. And I, I'm just so passionate about that because there's so many advisors out there. Why would you work with an advisor and have to invest in ESG investments outside of their management? Because that's what you want. You're just working with the wrong advisor. Now I would say that I'm, um... I'm one who tries to take emotion out of investment. I always find that that is the the best way. Uh, and but I think that when it comes to environmental, social, and governance investing, you can do it in a systemic, uh, systematic way to process that, so that you're getting those elements, but that one that you're you don't have blinders on for any one specific company or, or, or the thematic way of looking at, it, unless that's where you want to be. So if that is that, if that's your focus, then that's great. But I think for the, the, for, for every, for the, what I like is that in the sustainable investing or ESG space, I use those terms interchangeably. Uh, but what I find is that there, there are tools out there that, you can invest in that don't have to have that emotional attachment that, you know, from fear from a theoretical and from an investment standpoint, you could, you could have that investment. That's not purely emotional that if, if, if a security goes down 30% for whatever reason, uh, even if they're, their base of that. And, and I'm not talking about you use Tesla as an example, but it, whatever it is, you could have a way of evaluating that company. That's more than just, Hey, a belief system that incorporates these ESG data elements. Well, there's definitely opportunity for people to to get more information about this, to see if it's right for them, and not to be afraid of investing something that they believe in. Uh, and I think ESG investing offers incredible opportunity. And you know, I like to thank you, Chris, for uh, coming on today. I, I know we could talk for hours on this topic and. I might be talking to you about coming back on again to continue this conversation. Uh, but in the meantime, Chris, I'd like to give you the opportunity to uh, explain to people how you they could get in touch with your company and what your offerings are so that they can learn more. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Michael. Uh, so Northern Trust Asset Management uh, is 
one of the largest uh, asset management firms across the globe. Most of the ways that people interact with with our funds from the individual investor level is uh, through their advisors and through our exchange traded funds or mutual funds. We have a series of funds that look at uh, specifically if you're interested in ESG, we have a series of funds uh, in our ETF vehicle format. Uh, Flexures.com is our website. Uh, there's the products are, are listed there. Uh, also, our mutual fund line is Northern Funds, and there we do have sustainable funds uh, and ESG funds on that on that front as well. So uh, we definitely have opportunities for people to engage with Northern uh, using those investment vehicles as well as through their advisors and through institutional clients uh, that that rely on Northern just as well. Thank you very much, Chris. And I also want to encourage everybody to follow and subscribe to the Gen X Money Advisor YouTube channel. And you can also find more information about my services at genxwealthpartners.com. Chris, thank you for coming on to the show today. And I'm sure we'll be talking with you again in the future. Michael, it was my pleasure. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me and, and thanks everybody for listening. Thank you for listening to the Gen X Money Advisor podcast. Click the follow button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the hosts and or guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Gen X Wealth Partners. This content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional financial advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service providers with any questions you may have regarding regarding your individual situation. Securities offered through Kestra Investment Services, LLC, Kestra IS, member FNRA SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through Kestra Advisory Services, LLC, Kestra AS, an affiliate of Kestra IS. Gen X Wealth Partners is not affiliated with Kestra IS or Kestra AS.